Okay, we're going to do uh, the male reproductive system and uh, spermatogenesis today. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not going to draw male reproductive system. I don't need to draw it. So I'm using, um, actually it was past question. I don't know if you can imagine opening the paper and seeing this facing you. But anyway, there we go. So, um, labels. Obviously, uh, the most obvious thing on this is the penis with its erectile tissue. And uh, this circle at the top, which represents the bladder. These two tubes coming down here are coming from the kidneys. So uh, these are the ureters. And this one running all the way down here is the urethra. I suppose the urethra. So the urethra is leading to the outside from both the bladder and from these structures down here to the testes. <coughs> so, um, just to put it into context of what happens here, these are the testes and these are, are involved in spermatogenesis, so they're involved in sperm production. They're also involved in testosterone production, so uh, some part and you need to know which parts do what and they're held outside of the body in a, a scrotal sac and the reason that they're held outside of the body is that the spermatozoa need a lower temperature than body temperature in order to develop. So the Spermatozoa are made in this area of the testis here, which is composed, as we'll see in a minute, of a lot of little tubes. So these are little seminiferous tubules. The spermatozoa then drain away into this area here, and this is called the epididymis. I think it's the, the, my least favourite part of the male reproductive system. Just because it's got a lot of it sounds in it, and one of them is a Y, which makes it really tricky to spell. Um, and from there, during ejaculation, they're going to pass up through this tube here, which is called the vas deferens. Nice and easy to remember. This is the one that leads to a vasectomy. Vasectomy is chopping through it. Probably don't want to think about that too much. Uh, obviously we have the same arrangement on either side, so the sperm are going to emerge down the vas deferens and then exit via the urethra. And then we've got paired glands here. These are the seminal vesicles. And these are going to produce secretions which are going to aid the sperm on their journey. Oh, I love that word. They're going on a little journey. And we've got this big chunky gland here that uh, is right round, it actually stretches right round these, these sort of junctions of these tubes. And this is the one that you'll have seen uh, on the hideous advert where the boy's talking to his dad about his prostate and his dad just wants to go away. This is the prostate gland. So we can see how it might cause problems in older men if it swells up because it's right at this very junction. Um, to quote the advert, that's going to spoil adult nap time, but it's also going to make it quite difficult to urinate. So, that's the sort of basic structure. Shouldn't be too difficult to get a grip on. And we're just going to have a look in slightly more detail again. Complete refusal to draw anything here. So, the testis itself is made up of all these little seminiferous tubules. What this diagram over here represents is, uh, and again you probably don't want to think about it, is a sort of a cross section through there and you're looking at the tube that forms these seminiferal tubules. They are kind of blind endings so if you were sort of to do run your pen along one of these wiggly tubules it starts and ends at the same place because what's happening in the tubules is that sperm are being made and then they're dropping off into the hole in the middle and then they're going to kind of drain away into this reet testis down here which itself is going to drain into the epididymis which is where the sperm undergo some maturation so you can see from this picture they've already got their little sort of heads and tails by that stage and then 
this is the vas deferens running up through the spermatic cord uh, with its supply of blood vessels and nerves. We don't need to worry about uh, any other detail than that. So, spermatogenesis, how does it go? So you've got this diagram in your booklets and we're just going to, in fact, I'll put a bit of paper over this side. <coughs> so, running from the sort of outside of the tubule in, the outside of the seminiferous tubules are made of germinal epithelium cells and these are diploids, so they're 2N. And don't forget that your cell division stuff is in this component. So the cell division stuff we did at the end of just before Christmas last year is all in here. So germinal epithelial cells, their job is to undergo mitosis and make many um, spermatogonia, I suppose. So they, it's, it, you'll see varying accounts. Some people say, yeah, the germinal epithelial cells undergo lots of mitoses to make loads of them and then they grow and then we refer to them as spermatogonia. In other accounts you'll see them dividing by mitosis this, to form spermatogonia which can divide by mitosis and increase in size. Um, <clears throat> you won't get too hung up on it. The idea is that you're going, well, a male is going to produce spermatozoa all the way through his life from puberty onwards. He's going to make about a million a day, I think it is, something like that. Uh, it's quite a lot, so you need, you know, you'd pretty soon run out of germinal epithelial cells if you just did meiosis. So they need to make loads of them to start, to kickstart that process off to make a lot more. So, mitosis is going to lead to the spermatogonia, and everything that's sort of to do with spermatogenesis, which is the gametogenesis that makes sperm, uh, it starts with that spermato. So we're going to start with gonia. And I'm guessing that, you know, you could probably make up a little mnemonic or a, an, an acrostic or something to remember this sequence. We're then going to get growth, so an increase in size, uh, so the cytoplasm is going to increase in size, obviously not the nucleus, and make primary spermatocytes, and again those are diploid. They then undergo meiosis 1 and divide, so they do cytokinesis. And because they've done meiosis 1, we've split those pairs of chromosomes apart. The homolo homologous chromosomes have been divided, one into each of the new cells. And they're going to be then haploid cells, so that's quite important. And these are called secondary spermatocytes. Now, if you're talking about those in an exam, you do need to be very clear as to whether you are talking a primary one, diploid, or a secondary one, haploid. Secondary spermatocytes, their only job is to do meiosis 2 and again cytokinesis and they make these little rounded cells, undifferentiated, called spermatids. Again, haploid, there can't be anything else now. And those are then going to differentiate and they are going to develop a tail, flagellum, what's called a middle piece, which contains the mitochondria, which provide the ATP, and the head. And you can see that now we've kind of, having got them up to size, we've then split the cytoplasm pretty evenly between those cells. And because we've split the cytoplasm pretty evenly, they haven't got a lot left. So really, a, a sperm is just a sort of, you know, a, a tail propelling a nucleus uh, towards the female. Now, in the first picture, I showed you those cells dropping off into the lumen, the middle of the tubule. And so what you'll sometimes see on exam questions is this kind of, you know, can you label this going from the outside uh, into the middle? and spermatogonia and germinal epithelium around the outside. Next layer of cells in are the primary spermatocytes, then secondary, 
then spermatids, little round cells, and then the spermatozoa in the middle. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is that it's got these long cells that go from the outside to the inside of the tube. And those are called Sertoli cells. You'll also see them referred to as nurse cells because they nourish and um, the developing sperm and protect them from the immune system. So they've got uh, that function and you do need to know that function. Obviously if you sort of get a collection of Coke cans and look at them from the top, which is pretty much what seminiferous tubules look like when you slice through them, uh, there are little gaps in between, but those are not gaps in a human body. They're filled with cells. Obviously there'll be blood vessels as well going through there. <coughs> um, but one of these groups of cells, the Leydig cells, they're the ones responsible for testosterone, testi oh, just written testes instead, testosterone, which is the male uh, steroid hormone, obviously. So what do you need to know? You need to be able to label the male reproductive system. You need to be able to label a uh, section through. You need to be able to uh, parrot off that sequence of spermatogenesis, going from germinal epithelial cells to spermatozoa. You need to know which of those cells are haploid and which are diploid. Um, so yeah, you need to be able to, I think you need to be able to write an account of that. It has been an essay question on a couple of occasions. Um, and you need to be able to explain why you get more uh, sperm than you've got spermatogonia. And it's just purely because every one spermatogonium is going to end up as four uh, spermatozoa. Anyway, enjoy.